Hey guys, I have with me a woman who understands how to grow and scale a business. And she is the founder of Empire Life. And what I like about her is her approach on raising your rates. Because really, Allison, that is the name of the game. And we were talking beforehand, you've got a podcast, um, I've got a podcast as well. And really like a podcast is boosting your authority. But what good is boosting your authority if you can't make more revenue? <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. Like what are we what are we doing this for? Is to I know. support to be out there and support people. And as we all rise together, we are also rising with our clients yeah. and with our community and leaving a legacy or the clients that I support, they're really wanting to leave or they are leaving a legacy for their families. And as they support more clients, they're also supporting themselves. And if it, that latter part, sometimes, especially for female oriented founders, it might be left off. Yeah, absolutely. I know sometimes we think about that last and then wonder why we're not growing. Um, now let's, before we kind of dive into like the nitty gritty of like how to raise your rates and how do I actually do that? Um, I want to talk about your podcast. So what has your experience been podcasting and how has it impacted your business? Well, I started in the Empire Life podcast in 2018, and I think we're coming up on a hundred, almost a hundred episodes. Nice. We're on 80 something. We're going to pop some kava or champagne or something <laughs> <laughs> because I, I read recently that like 1% or maybe it's less than 1% of podcasts make it past. Is it 50 episodes? I'm trying to remember that. It's, it's actually 10. It's is 10. That, oh, okay. I know. Like some don't even make it past 10. I know you would know the exact statistic because that's your business. And so we, we've made it way past 10. But my experience was I had, you know, maybe two, I would say two years ago, I got this microphone here and just recently I got these headphones and a, a really nice backdrop. You know, before I had the wire headphones, the AirPod, you know, before the buds, the, yeah. the what are those called? The air, yeah, the earbuds yeah. for the AirPods. That before those even came out, I had the wire, I was recording it with the camera on my computer. And I remember one of, I think it was my second guest. She's huge at this point. She's doing deals with all kinds of really big clients. And she was a lot further along than me. And I had reached out to her. So that was another tip I was going to give is to craft a script and start reaching out to people that you would mm -hmm. like on your podcast. And I remember she came, when she came on, I was asking her because she was a lot further ahead than me in her business at that time. It was my first year in business and she had been, I think, five plus years and did massive events with like 2000 women and these big oh. conference centers, just so, so many massive things. And I said, do I need a microphone? Do I need these headphones? I asked her on the podcast, like when we were live, what do oh, you nice. think about this? And she said... I think the most important thing is to get the content out there. Yeah. And just start. And I'm ecstatic at this point looking back <laughs> that I took <laughs> and I took that advice because I have had clients also in the past where they might have hesitated to start recording that first episode. They thought that they needed the this kind of mic that I have, the different kind of headphones, uh soundproof room a certain yeah. backdrop. I mean, you name it. They think that they need to have that even for their first episode. And as you build, or if you have sponsors, you have client, you can take some of the money that you are making in your business and then invest in the more, you know, the camera and the microphone. And I think that was a big key piece for me because I almost felt less than yeah, when I first started in the space right and until i had better equipment and i felt and i really feel like i'm doing my listeners more of a service 
and I'm supporting them more when the sound quality is good, yeah. when they can see me good, when the, it's a lot of quality, right? And then we also have a video editor now on the team that it's been about a year. Well, we've had one for about a year and we just got a new one three months ago, I think. And so that also increases our content with the video yeah. and the quality what I wouldn't say, I think that's my biggest takeaway is that you don't need all of those things at first. You don't even necessarily need to fully edit the whole version of no. your podcast. You just need to get it out there and keep, continue to build. Agree. You got to start somewhere. And so do you find it affected like the revenue or how your the business part grew, like getting clients or connections? Like how did it affect it that way? For me, it's been huge in like right now for our up for our podcast, we almost have all the recordings recorded for the year. So Sweet. we're at this point, we're thinking about making more episodes. So bringing, uh, bringing our video editor in and paying them more. But to answer your question directly, when I have those podcast episodes, I'm connecting with these incredible female founders from mm -hmm. all around the world deeper, deeply and getting to know them. And my audience is getting to know them and giving them sort of a backdoor pass to showcase their vision to my audience. And that builds creating deeper relationships in the green room. And then on the podcast that builds relationships for a long time that then they would think about me and refer me to specific clients or send me a DM. And that's even one of my podcast questions in the application is if they are wanting to collaborate in some mm -hmm. way. Perfect. I think that's important because we're putting out the content or we're doing a lot behind the scenes to edit and feature them in the most professional, eloquent and high quality way it's amazing to have that be a reciprocal or at least that we're open that this is a collaboration mm -hmm. between one another. So I think that's an important piece too, that I would start asking towards the beginning of the podcast to my guests. And there were people who said, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to share. I would ask directly before I had the application in an email like, are you going to be able to share my podcast with your audience? Anything about it or was announce it. And some people said, no, I know that's crazy. And I was like, okay, <clears throat> well, that gives me a great insight that this is not necessarily reciprocal and yeah. we may not be in alignment with this collaborative that we want to support each other. And while that's okay, it's better to ask it at, at the forefront and create this environment because we get to set the tone for how we want our podcast to go and be and who we want, who's a good fit to be on our podcast. Agreed. And I think that relationship part and the collaborating and partnering referral, like all of those things, it opens up so many doors, not only for growth, but other like new opportunities for speaking or being on another show and yeah, that's honestly my favorite part of podcasting. Um, so I want to get into your area of expertise, and that is helping clients. Um, like once they ha are building authority, building a book or podcasting, whatever that may be, um, raising rates can feel like a daunting task. Like, you know, you need to do it, but you kind of don't know how. And it's almost like your, your head trash and your brain gets in the way. Like what is holding us back from raising a rates? I, I even know I've been guilty of it. For me, I've heard with my clients, one of the number one things and with looking at the workbook, we have a, a free workbook on yeah. our website. That's about raising your prices guide and seeing people, seeing clients outcome doing, going through the workbook or you know, us supporting them. I've seen that there's a concept where we don't want to leave anybody behind, mm. uh, especially for female founders. We, a lot of us go into it thinking, 
I can support everybody. My vision, my message is for everybody. And if I niche down or if I charge more money, that might right. be me niching down. Ooh. And then there's going to be people who cannot afford right. my rates. And because of that, that means that I'm no longer for everybody. Interesting. I've never thought of it that way. But yeah, it's true because you feel like you're going to let your clients down if you or you're squeezing people out or you're. Yeah. I, I could see how that would happen. <laughs> It's intuitive because a lot of us that go into entrepreneurship, we really are there to support mm -hmm. people. But I think the missing, that missing element or the missing piece is admitting to ourselves that yeah. we're, our time is not for everybody. It is not a fit for everyone. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Yeah. It's not a fit. It's not an alignment. And not only for the business person, that's supporting the client also for the client you know we need to get honest with ourselves like do for example do i want to support clients who are starting out mm -hmm. and maybe they don't know their brand colors they are kind of fuzzy on their mission they kind of know their mission they don't have a team yet they might have a, a few thousand dollars coming in a month or they might be in the negative and that is something that a lot of women really enjoy our different business owners enjoy supporting. Or do I want to support someone who's maybe mid-level or someone who's further along and they're scaling their business? And when I got really honest with myself about that question, I decided I need to fully commit to women or business owners that are female who are scaling right. their business because I've done all all the whole gamut and i can support the whole the whole area what i can create blogs podcast content and graphics social media content that does support the whole range of women but with my time mm -hmm. i need to really niche i think that's where it gets a little uncomfortable to be able to say, okay, this is exactly, I'm literally focused on this niche of these people. And even if we come against resistance, because when I made that choice at the beginning, I was the whole gamut. And I was also working with men and women, right. and supporting men and women. And I had a, I've had two masterminds at this point and men and women were invited to be in them. And so when I made that decision, I think it was 2019, my Facebook group is only going to be women. Everybody that I support is only female founders. I did have a, a few men say to me, I'm so sad. I've been following yeah. your content for these years and I really want your support. And like, this is the deal. This is what feels authentic and in alignment for me. And I mostly only had female clients at that point anyways. Yeah. It is hard to say no, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think as women, it, it's even harder. But I like what you said there. And that was telling the person that you were you needed to be in alignment with like who you were and, and what was best for you. And I think once you phrase it that way, then people are like, like, how can they argue with that? Yes. And he can bring the, you know, this particular person that I was thinking of in my head, uh, I did invite him to bring his female founder friends. You know, <laughs> like, well, bring them over. If you really love my content, I would love yeah. for you to refer them. Like, this is the direction that our company is going in. And yeah. you're always welcome to come to our events. It's not like we turn men away as he had been to a lot of our in-person events. Oh, okay and followed our communities that he did choose to leave the some of the online communities because yeah. he didn't want to be the only man there and it was no yeah. longer serving him so fair enough i i think when we do reach that if we have some kind of resistance yeah. from people that's also maybe the number two reason why someone wouldn't raise their prices because they're worried what someone might say mm -hmm. or think that could be a previous client someone in our community or a family member and or that they think I've also heard they may think, well, are they going to think that I think I'm better than them now? 
Hmm. Yeah, I've never. Yeah, I, that has never crossed my mind. Um, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, and and the fear of like rejection, like what if they do leave because <laughs> they don't like yeah. it and they don't like the change. It's like there's always that fear as well. I'm sure. Yes, like I I had to be comfortable. I think I had close to four thousand in my Facebook group, and I lost about half. Oh wow! And you know, so now and then. So that's, but I have like 99 or more than that percent increase in engagement. Sweet. People DMing me, people connecting, like even people from the group meeting in person and traveling different cities to meet each other, working together. We published a best-selling book and most of the women that I featured in the book that are also best-selling authors now they were from the Facebook group. Wow. So there's so many when we can admit that to ourselves. Yeah. So many it's fruit. It's really fruitful. And I think too, like, you know, sometimes numbers are not necessarily better. It's like, it's like an email list. You can have 10,000 people on your email mail list, but if only a thousand mm-hmm. of them are responding, then what does it matter? I would rather have a thousand people <clears throat> and then respond and take action and do things. Um, I think you have to be okay with that. Now, how do you, how do you know when it's time to raise your rates? Cause you're not going to be raising it just for the sake of raising it. Like, is there anything like, should you analyze your numbers or. I would say every year oh, I, wow. would check in, I would check in to and i that's how a lot of businesses do it if you think about you know rent apartments (laughs) car payments like a lot of different businesses will analyze that and there is an inflation of money every year and that's a whole nother year like to check in every year that's a whole nother year of experience true and that equates for at least some percentage of raising your rates, yeah. at least higher value. Well, I would say, yeah, higher value because most likely you've gained experience through that year, which now equates to higher value. Just like if we're in corporate and we're applying for a job and we have three years experience as opposed to one, we can ask for more money. We yeah. can negotiate. And I think that's a, that's another missing piece. Yeah, that's smart. And I I remember like being in the VA business and I still find it hard sometimes. It's like equating that whole time for dollars and like how to get out of that. How do you retrain your brain so that you're not always stuck on the clock? I think to make maybe loosely designed packages I find that really helpful when businesses like right now in this moment, when we're recording this podcast, I think we have last I looked like five different job openings at Empire Life. So when I'm going out there and I'm looking to bring people onto the team, either to hire contract work, Mm -hmm. I want to see at least some kind of loose package that I know how many hours they do what for. Mm. And uh, uh, for example, there was, a, I got one today because I'm looking immediately <laughs> like, like last year, I wish I already had one, <laughs> uh, a person to support me with writing our emails and our weekly blog. And we also have a podcast email that goes out and once a month right now, maybe it'll be more because we have so many episodes coming up. And she gave me like three different tiers of hours that she could work on my business. Right. The first one was 10, I think, and then 15, or 16 or 15, and then 20. And that was a different price for each one. So I could ask her, she's a graphic designer and she does presentations and emails and blogs and a lot of different things, but I could tell her I want specific tasks done in those times 
but I know what kind of tasks she already does. Right. So I can say, okay, how long do I think these tasks are going to take her? And is that, uh, and another example, when I was first doing, when I first started Empire Life, I'm coming from software. I'm also a software developer. Oh, wow. And I've, this is my third company. So I'm third time founder. (laughs) I was thinking that I was going to coach the, I mean, I was coaching them and mentoring them, which I didn't even really realize kind of fell into my lap that I was doing that co-current or at the same time yeah. as building out their website, their backend, their email marketing funnel, Facebook ads. And I was a whole package deal where I would say, okay, well, not every client needed Facebook ads, right. but let's say they needed a, a sales funnel and an email, one email marketing funnel, part of that sales funnel in the back end, or they needed an online course, I would have certain packages where I'd say, okay, this is about, this is the cost of that. And it includes three iterations that we talk about. And each one of those iterations is like five edits and really specific in the contract. Right. And then they would pay that per month. And I was getting what we agreed on done in the back end per month. And then we would have a meeting, like a few meetings a month. And so it was, it was more like a container. Yeah. I would highly suggest really thinking that through about how many hours is this going to take me? Yeah. What is it that I want to do within this container? And kind of starting to draft up a contract that you could edit a little, like I said, it could be kind of loose mm-hmm. and flexible but they could pay per month. And I would suggest like six months or a year contract. So, and I, you know, my preference is a year. All of my programs are a year. During COVID, I I accepted six month contracts because there was so much uncertainty, right? And and, uh, I really, I think three of my clients did six months and COVID times, and then they both renewed for another six months. So it still ended up being a year. Sweet. Yeah, it was, it was amazing to, to give that option, but I would say definitely a year is the best. (laughs) I prefer that. And then if they sign on for another year, even uh, more amazing. I've had some clients that I'm still supporting them after three years in some capacity. And I think too, with the the packages, even though it's hard to wrap your head around and, you know, maybe someone could go to someone like you to kind of make that happen, but like you're in, it, it's all based on value. I'm giving you all my expertise, all this stuff versus being like a secretary that's checking off the list and doing all those things. And to me, really, you're doing the other person a service because they have like a budget in mind. Right. And if you give them an hourly rate, they're like, Oh, I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to be. So I I almost feel like it's, it's beneficial for both sides. It is for sure. Because it also allows you to estimate about how much money will be coming in. Yeah. I love tracking my finances. I love my taxes. So I want to know. I do. Like, I know it's kind of strange, but I I want to know kind of for my budget or, okay, I'm going to spend this amount on groceries yeah. or the, you know, like foundational, and I'm going to be able to save this amount or invest back into my business that it gives us a, a heads up to be able to plan more accordingly yeah. for that or know what we can invest into our business, know who we mm, can hire. True know if we need more clients or not is it opens up yeah and it, for it them almost, too to i budget. agree when you think about it that way it is it, it feels less like you're going hour to hour month to month it feels like okay i know what recurring web revenue i'm gonna have ongoing and you can plan and invest more effectively when you format it that way that's smart i love that Um, so as we wrap up, I want to make sure people know how to find you and also grab that guide that you mentioned. So it's on my website. It's empirelifeacademy.com and there there will be a pop-up or if you go to any of the pages, it'll say free guide on the top. Perfect. 
All right. And so I hope people that are out there podcasting and growing their business that you change your rates and uh, take Allison's advice so that you can and grow and scale. Any last thought for anyone that is looking to grow? I just reach out. You know, we have a blog, podcast, well, tons of complimentary resources. You know, reach out to us on DM on a DM if you want to know more. Awesome. I appreciate your advice so much. And uh congratulations on the success of your podcast. And I look forward to being a guest on the show. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thanks so much, Allison.